Growing up in the 2000s, there were three essential things you needed to own in order to be the cool kid in town. A Nintendo DS, an iPod Touch, and a Nintendo Wii. I had two out of three, that's pretty decent. Okay, so back in my younger days, it seemed like everyone, literally everyone, owned a Wii. It was the king of the casual market, selling over 100 million units worldwide. The innovative motion controls, plus the wider appeal of Wii Sports, attracted to a massive margin of casual gamers, families, and even the elderly. Cause why do this when you can do this? Nice par. It uh, helps if you have a strap. Of course, I myself had to dive into this craze. I loved Nintendo. So after saving up all my Christmas money, birthday money, literally any income I could get my hands on, I finally bought a Nintendo Wii. It's really weird to think about nowadays, but this is starting to become the nostalgia craze. It went from NES, Super Nintendo, and N64 to now GameCube, DS, and Wii. And I'm not really sure how I feel about that. I had to have been around 7 or 8 when I bought this thing. It came bundled with Wii Sports, and I literally played all that it had to offer. I got every single training medal, I played every sport hundreds of times, except for golf, that one, that one sucked. It was the only game I had for quite a long time. It took forever to gain any sort of income. I was a kid. However, after weeks and months went by, I finally got my hands on a game that quickly became one of my favorites. Gosh, that never gets old. Super Mario Galaxy, one of the most beloved games in the gaming community. A Mario game with a cool concept combined with a console that was selling like hotcakes was bound to be an extreme success. It was Mario in space. You don't see that every day. Super Mario Galaxy was the first official game I got for my Wii, aside from Wii Sports, and I absolutely loved it. I beat every level, collected every star. It was brutal as a kid, but well worth it in the end. From what I remember, this game was amazing, but it has been a while since I've broken out the old Wii, so today I thought it'd be fun to take a look back at one of my childhood favorites and see if it still holds up today. And spoiler alert, it obviously does. Super Mario Galaxy's concept originated from a tech demo titled Super Mario 128. It was held at a convention back in August of 2000 called Space World. The demo showed off the power of the GameCube and the different capabilities and new features it could do, most notably the number of objects on screen and the spherical-based terrain. The director of the tech demonstration, Yoshiaki Koizumi, wanted to expand upon this spherical terrain idea further in a future game. The creator of the Italian plumber himself, Shigeru Miyamoto, liked the idea and wanted to implement this mechanic into a potential Mario game. And thus, development started. It only made sense for them to use gravity as the main gimmick of the game because, you know, spheres look like planets and whatnot, and that's how the whole space theme came to be, and Super Mario Galaxy was born. The game released back in 2007 for the Wii and became one of the greatest hits on the gaming market, the end. Okay, we're done with the history lesson. Let's get into the actual game. So apparently every 100 years, the Mushroom Kingdom hosts this star festival. A special comet flies across the land, dropping star bits and shooting stars. And to celebrate this occasion, they throw a big event all throughout the land. Peach invites Mario to the festival only to be greeted by the big bad Bowser who crashes the party and steals the princess. Similar to Paper Mario, Bowser decides to take the whole castle into outer space. Right before Mario tries to save Peach, Kamek comes out of nowhere and smacks him all the way onto a different planet, and now, we're back to square one. Mario then gets greeted by these special space bunnies. You play a game of tag, they spawn this pedestal, and then you get greeted by everyone's favorite Mario Kart character, Rosalina. She then goes on this spiel about how she's the protector of the cosmos, and the only way to save Peach is by collecting the grand stars. She gives you a pet Luma, and boom, you're playing Mario Galaxy. Jeez, I played this game a ton as a kid. The whole idea of Mario in space was so cool to me. The way you jump from planet to planet and run completely around little spheres of land felt so different, and while it does feel janky at first, you get used to it after a while. Graphically, the game looks amazing. Every planet is distinct and pops with color. But the game that involves space and tons of different planets and galaxies, there is a surprising amount of diversity, and it never got old and always came up with something new. The game has an incredible soundtrack as well. Everything was orchestrated, and it gave it a more powerful and grand feel to everything you were doing. Not only does it sound grand and magnificent, but it also has some of the most calming and beautiful pieces of music my ears 
have ever listened to. Mario Control is about the same as any other 3D Mario, although he has a few more tricks up his sleeve. You got the essentials, the triple jump, wall jump, long jump, backflip, and side flip, but in this game you also have the new spin thing. I, I don't... I don't really know what to call it. What's a Wii game without some motion controls? With just a little flick of the wrist with the Wii Remote, Mario will use the new spin ability. This move is pretty versatile and is used to break objects, fight enemies, use launch stars, which by the way is one of the most satisfying things to do in this game. It also gives you a gust of height whenever you use it after a jump and helps with precise platforming or correcting yourself in midair. If you point the Wii Remote at the sensor bar, a blue star cursor will pop up on screen. This mechanic is also pretty handy and is used as a little magnet for these items called star bits. You can use these star bits to stun enemies, and it can also be used as a currency to feed these hungry Lumas for specific missions. Some of the movement in this game kind of felt wonky compared to previous entries. Like, I'm not really sure if it was my nunchuck, but performing side flips was harder than it should have been. Triple jumps require more momentum than usual, and they also opted to not include any sort of fast movement like dives or rolls. Everything feels a little floatier, and yes, obviously you are in space, so it does make sense to have a less gravity feel to the game, but I think the main reason for this change was because of the franchise's shift in gameplay. The two games beforehand, Mario 64 and Sunshine, has big 3D sandbox worlds to mess around with, while Super Mario Galaxy is more on the linear side of things, focusing more on the platforming aspect of these games rather than the 3D open space. 64 and Sunshine had a lot of fancy movement to traverse through these larger worlds, but with this game having a more linear path to your objective, I guess they thought it was unneeded to add this type of stuff? The game has more of an emphasis on platforming, so having a floatier feel to your movement helps out with precise jumps in a 3D environment. Mario Galaxy was different from the rest, from the unique feeling of the gravity to the 3D linear level design. It was obvious they were trying something all new with this game, and ultimately, it paid off in the end. After collecting your first grand star, you're brought back to the Comet Observatory. This is the main hub of the game, where you run around and collect stars from tons of different planets. I will never forget this area. It was so cool being a part of this huge spaceship full of Lumas, and the music in this place is so iconic. The observatory is powered by Power Stars, the main collectible of the game. To get back to Peach, you'll be collecting these powerful grand stars to power the main hub and fly to Bowser to give him a fistful of justice. You get these stars by going to different planets and doing various missions and objectives. These missions vary from planet to planet, but they usually consist of fighting a boss or doing a certain task for someone. And can I just say that I'm impressed with the number of different bosses there are in this game. Almost every new galaxy had some sort of unique boss fight. One of my favorite things about Mario Galaxy is all the unique stuff you do. This game has a ton of variety and has you going around doing all sorts of stuff. One mission you'll be fighting a giant rock monster and the next thing you know it you're surfing on a manta ray racing through this humongous water obstacle course. It seems like every level has a new element or mechanic to use. However, with having so many new things being introduced all the time, I felt like certain mechanics got left in the dust and could have been expanded upon in a bigger way. Best example I can think of is the Red Star Power-Up. You can use it to fly around for a little while, and you unlock it pretty late in the game, but you only use it once. Once in the entire game. That's like if you were a kid that got a sick new toy, played with it for 15 minutes, and couldn't play with it ever again. I mean, it's there. Why not use it? There are quite a few instances like this. I mean, yeah, there's tons of variety here. You always find something new, but I felt like some really cool ideas were just underutilized. I guess this is a good time to transition into the new power-ups. First up on our list is the Bee Shroom. It lets you hover above ground until your meter runs out. You can climb up and through honey substances, and since you are a bee, you can now stand on floating flowers. Honestly, not a big fan of this one. I like power-ups based on how they feel and how fun they are to use, and this one is just boring. The way you fly around is so slow, and it limits your movement options. You can't backflip, you can't long jump, it's slow, and just not that fun to use. I think it would have been cool if you could maybe use your stinger or have a faster way of moving, but yeah, this one is not that good. Next up is the Boo Shroom. I like this one better than the Bee Shroom, but not by much. 
Again, there's not many things you can do with it, and it's just a little boring to use. You can shake the Wii Remote to turn invisible to phase through objects, you can use it for nothing else. Moving on, we have the Fire Flower. This lets you run around and throw fireballs, and it also has a time limit, which is a weird choice in my opinion. Next up is the Ice Flower. I like this one. You can run across water, you can freeze enemies. My only complaint is, again, it has a timer. It felt really cool skating across water, and I think out of all the items, this one was used the most creatively. But again, I think they could have expanded upon it just a little bit more. Like a couple of mechanics in this game, these items were heavily underutilized. They are sort of like glorified keys to get past certain areas. I think they should have put a little more time into making them more fun to use, give them more abilities. The concepts are there, I just think they should have taken a little more time to develop these items more in depth. And don't even get me started on the Spring Shroom. This is probably one of the worst power-ups in the Mario franchise. It feels so out of control, and all it does is gives you a jump boost. It's tolerable, don't get me wrong, but this item was pretty useless and a little uninspired if you ask me. I want to make sure I'm making myself clear. The amount of variety in this game isn't a bad thing. It's something Galaxy does extremely well. If anything, it makes you excited to see what comes up next and constantly keeps you on your toes. I'm just saying some concepts I really enjoyed got buried with more and more stuff and never got a chance to show its full potential, if that makes sense. Of course, with every Wii game that came out in the 2000s, Nintendo had to implement some sort of motion control gimmick, and Mario Galaxy is no exception. Every once in a while, the game will throw at you some sort of mission involving holding the Wii Remote in some awkward way. Rolling Ball Missions has you trying to balance a ball using the Wii Remote as a joystick. These missions sucked. The Manta Ray Races had you twisting and pointing the Wii Remote at the screen. These missions broke my wrist. And finally, the Garbage Destruction minigames. And uh, all I'm gonna say is these missions are the worst stars to collect in the entire game. As a kid, it took me forever to collect these stars. You have a strict time limit, you almost have to be perfect with every bomb throw you do, and it's just terrible and not that enjoyable. These missions weren't my favorites. They felt gross, they weren't fun, and I wasn't a big fan. Another way Galaxy mixes up the standard format is the Prankster Comets, which are essentially extra challenges for more stars. These comets spawn randomly, and most of the time I would just be doing my own thing whenever they would pop up. I would collect a star, head back to the hub, go to the planet selection screen, and- Oh! Oh, okay, I, I guess we're doing this now. Every comet has a certain color corresponding to the challenge they have. The red ones are speedrun challenges, complete a previous mission under a certain time limit. The yellow ones are fast foe challenges, giving all the enemies and hazards extra speed. The white ones are daredevil comets, which for the most part have you trying to defeat a boss with just one piece of health. The blue ones are cosmic comets, and challenge you to a race against a cosmic clone of yourself for a star. And finally, the purple comets. This comet has you collecting 100 purple coins within a specific galaxy. The way they handled this particular type of comet challenge was weird to me. Every previous prankster comet I mentioned before spawned randomly throughout the game and gave you something fresh and different from all the other missions from time to time. But all the purple coin challenges were introduced late in the game and were just some challenges to do if you were trying to fully complete the game. I was 100%ing the game up until the final boss and after I beat it, there were about 15 more stars to collect, and all of them were purple coin comets. This got really tedious. These comets would have been perfect to spread throughout the game, to give you something different to do from all the others. But having all of them spawn at the very end of the game was a bad choice, and it got real old real fast. I mean, if you're not planning on fully completing the game, then it's something you won't need to worry about, but if you do go out of your way to collect every star, get ready to collect hundreds of purple coins. This game has a lot of meat on its bones. It has plenty of stars to collect, the difficulty wasn't too hard, wasn't too easy, it had a pretty good balance, and overall, I think this game is extremely good. Mario Galaxy was a huge part of my childhood. I remember doing everything in this game. I completed it to 100%. It looks great, sounds amazing, and the gameplay is different, but also familiar to previous Mario games. It brought something new to the table, and the amount of variety in this game is hard to beat. Mario Galaxy is so nostalgic, and I loved it so, so much, and it still holds up remarkably well 
today. But as for the sequel, honestly, I don't really know much about it. I remember seeing it in the game section at Walmart and thinking to myself, there's a sequel? I never knew about it for the longest time. I didn't have cable or internet for news outlets. I saw the game at Walmart, and that was it. I remember borrowing it from a friend sometime later, playing through it all the way, and never touched it again. So I thought, why not kill two birds with one stone and not only tackle the first game, but the sequel as well. Development started right after Mario Galaxy 1. It was originally planned to be no more than a simple expansion, even having the nickname Super Mario Galaxy 1.5 during early stages of development. The team took all the scrapped ideas from the first game and kept adding more and more ideas to the point where they just said, screw it, let's just make it a sequel. The making of the game took about two and a half years and was released to the public in May of 2010, and Super Mario Galaxy 2 was born. So, from what I understand, the story is sort of a retelling of the previous game. It's like they straight up ripped the same story, that's so weird to me. I thought this was supposed to be a sequel. But anyways, Peach invites Mario to the Star Festival. On the way there, you find the baby Luma from the first game just chilling in the bushes for some reason. You make it to the festival, Bowser crashes the party, takes the princess, and boom, you're playing Mario Galaxy 2. Even though this game advertises itself as a sequel, I still consider it just a huge expansion from the first game, which isn't a bad thing at all. Why fix something that isn't broken, you know what I mean? They ripped the foundation and the engine of the first game and just built upon that in tons of new ways. Graphically, the game still looks amazing as ever and still has that vibrant color and diversity from the first game. The soundtrack is also so good. I would even go as far as to say that this soundtrack might even be better than Galaxy 1. I noticed that there's a lot more remixes of older games like Mario 64 and Super Mario World. I'm a sucker for nostalgia, so if I hear a remix of a Super Mario World song, you know I'm head bobbing to that beat if you know what I'm saying. After collecting your first power star, you're taken back to the starship and are greeted by this dude named Lubba. He then tells you he needs these stars to power the ship, and in return, he'll take you to the center of the universe so that you can give Bowser another fistful of justice and save the princess once again. I find it very odd that Rosalina and the Comet Observatory are absent from the main story until the very end of the game. I'm just not sure why they would wait that long to introduce that stuff so late in the game. Aside from a few references, it almost seems like they completely forgot about Rosalina till late in development. But you know what they didn't forget about? The gameplay. Like I mentioned before, Mario Galaxy takes the whole engine from the previous game. Mario controls the same, the gravity feels the same, it still has that linear feel to it, you get the idea. Just like before, the goal of the game is simple, running around doing various missions for stars. It constantly innovates with new concepts and ideas, and every planet has something new to offer. I'm not kidding when I say almost every planet surprised me with something new. It also didn't feel like some concepts weren't used enough or overstayed their welcome. I think they did a pretty good job balancing ideas throughout the game better than Galaxy 1 did. It also felt like Galaxy 2 was more linear in comparison to the previous game. In Galaxy 1, it sort of felt like the game was trying to cater to sandbox style Mario games, having a whole hub world and having longer missions to do, while Mario Galaxy 2 ditches the hub world entirely and instead has a level to level world map format like normal linear 2D Mario games. I also noticed it has a lot more 2D sections in general. I think after developing the first game, the team realized what Mario Galaxy style truly was and just went for a full linear format for the whole game. Galaxy 2 does a good job not straying away from what made the first one so great. Every planet, galaxy, enemy boss is different from the rest, and it feels like there's endless amounts of ideas, and a lot of these ideas are some of my favorite additions to the Mario Galaxy franchise. The biggest new addition, of course, is Yoshi. This was the perfect thing to add in Galaxy. I love the way Yoshi feels in this game. He fits so well into the gameplay. Whenever you ride him, your star cursor gets replaced by a red dot symbolizing Yoshi's tongue and can be used to eat enemies, latch onto objects, etc. Yoshi also has his classic flutter kick to give you an extra gust of hang time. Along with the iconic rideable dinosaur comes three new types of food that give Yoshi special abilities. First one being the dash pepper that launches Yoshi at high speeds, letting you run up walls and sprint across water. The blimp fruit inflates Yoshi into a big Big balloon that lets you float upwards for a short while. And finally, the Bald Berry, which illuminates Yoshi to light up hidden paths and platforms in specific levels. I think Yoshi was the perfect new addition to the game, and it almost feels like he's been there ever since the first game, which was actually the original plan but was scrapped due to time constraints. 
All the previous power-ups make a return, except for the red star and, weirdly, the ice flower. Why have the fire flower and not the ice flower? And that was like my favorite power-up. But I guess to make up for that, Galaxy 2 added a couple more power-ups that I consider big steps in the right direction. First one being the Cloud Flower that lets you create a platform whenever you spin in midair. You're limited to only three platforms you can create, and to replenish it, you'll have to find another flower somewhere in the stage. I really like this one mostly because it doesn't take away your full moveset and doesn't have a timer unlike most power-ups in Galaxy 1, and the whole concept is pretty sick overall. Next, we have the Rock Mushroom. Every time you shake the Wii Remote, Mario will form into a giant boulder and launch you forward whichever way you're facing at high speeds. This one can get a little tricky to control. You move so fast you can't control your horizontal movement that well. But the way they did incorporate this item into some of the missions were really creative and enjoyable. And I guess I should mention the spin drill. It's exactly what the name implies. You spin and drill through the ground. I honestly don't know what else to say about it. Now, it wouldn't be a Mario Galaxy game without some gross motion control missions, now would it? Rolling ball missions make a return, and they are just as bad as ever. New to the game is these flying bird missions, replacing the manta ray ones from Galaxy 1. I'm not a big fan. The trash disposal missions also make a return, but are altered slightly. Instead of using bombs to blow up piles of trash, you use a fire flower to destroy rows and columns of boxes. These missions are way more tolerable than Galaxy 1's, and I definitely prefer these ones, but again, still not my favorite. One quick note about these missions, they happen very rarely in both games. I just thought I would mention them because they're really my only major complaint with both games. The prankster comments also make a return, only this time they've been slightly modified. For starters, they don't appear randomly, but instead spawn in a linear pattern. Every planet now has a new hidden collectible called the Comet Medal, which allows for prankster stars to spawn if you've collected a certain amount. I like this feature, it gives an incentive to obtain these medals. However, the placement of these collectibles is hit or miss. Some can be well hidden and encourage exploration, while on the other hand, some are just out in the open and are just kind of there. Also, the way they handled each prankster is, in my opinion, way better than Galaxy 1, most notably the purple coin comets. No more endgame exclusive pranksters. Each challenge is spread throughout the whole game, which is so much easier to digest. They even add a couple new types of challenges. The Romp Comet has you destroying a horde of enemies within a certain time limit. Double Time Comets increase the speed of certain hazards, replacing the Fast Foe Comets from Galaxy 1. Clone Comets has you doing a star mission, all while a group of cosmic clones copies every move you do, making it difficult to backtrack and constantly has you moving. This challenge replaces the cosmic clone races from the previous entry and offer a better challenge overall. And the final comet is the Green Comet. Okay, I lied, there is an endgame exclusive prankster, only this time, it's for every single mission in the game. If you collect all 120 stars, the green comets will appear in every galaxy, which spawns green stars that are usually in hidden and hard to reach places. This is the end game content and has you replaying every level trying to find and collect these stars. It's basically a huge extra 120 star scavenger hunt. I prefer this end game content way more than what Galaxy 1 did. In that game, if you collected all 120 stars, you would unlock Luigi as a playable character, which is really cool, don't get me wrong. But in order to complete that game 100%, you had to get all 120 of the exact same stars as Luigi. Yes, in Galaxy 2, you're playing the same levels as well, but at least you're doing something different from the main objectives. These stars at least require more exploration. I think it's a nice change of pace, and honestly, it's not too bad in my opinion. And that is Super Mario Galaxy 2. Honestly, it's better than I remember it. It's probably been around nine or 10 years since I last played this game, and I'm glad I finally got back to doing so. This game is so good, and it fixed a few problems I had with Galaxy 1, and I highly recommend it. The Galaxy games are something special. They mix 3D Mario with linear game design, and it blends super well. The variety in both games is hard to beat, and it's constantly throwing new ideas and concepts at you non-stop. These games both look good, have two magnificent soundtracks, and the gameplay is awesome and incredibly addicting. If I had to choose which one I liked better, I honestly couldn't say. They're both so similar, it's hard to compare the two. 
Mario Galaxy 1 has more sentimental value to me, while on the other hand, I think Mario Galaxy 2 has the better ideas and concepts. Again, these games are amazing. They're great. I spent hours playing both games as a kid, and after a decade since being released to the public, these games both still hold up remarkably well to this day.